Hello, I'm Katie Jarvis. This episode is brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. Trust Nutrient Ag Solutions for access to best-in-class solutions and service to help you lead the field this season and beyond. Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is Scott Williams, the host of Real Foot Forward, where every week we explore the people, the culture, and the history of our home right here in West Tennessee, just like we do every single day here at our museum and heritage park, Discovery Park of America. I'm really excited about our guest today, Ben Harris, who is with Driving Innovation, a mobile program that supports economic and workforce development in Tennessee's rural communities. Welcome, Ben. Thank you. Thanks for having us. This place is awesome. You bet. Um, this was your first time here, right? It is. Yeah, so it's shocking when you first get here. Yeah, it? it's it's amazing. It's uh, it's like Disneyland and Union City. It's amazing. <laughs> it is. When you come around that corner and see the building like rising up, it's kind of foggy today, so I don't know yeah. what it looks But when it's sunny and the sun's gleaming on it, you feel like you've landed in Oz. Yeah, it's awesome. Uh, so, so where did you grow up? I uh, actually grew up about 30 miles from Jackson in uh, Lexington, Tennessee. That's uh, in Henderson County. And what brothers, sisters? Uh, I have two sisters. I have a, an older sister, Marcy, and a um, younger, younger sister. She's 12 years younger than me, uh, Alex. And um, what did your uh, parents do? Uh, that's That always it, it leads to a long story. Um, my, my mother, as I was growing up, owned a flower shop. Uh, so she was in the the floral business. My grandmother was actually in the funeral business. Those two businesses work pretty well together. My father is actually in the uh, real estate development business in Jackson, and uh, he's actually the county mayor of Madison County as well. Excellent. And I and I know when you're growing up from what from from uh, the research that I did that they may be discussed issues and politics and social issues a lot around the dinner table. Yeah. Up. Yeah. So, so my, my mother is definitely on the left side of things and my dad is on the right side of things. So I, I pretty much, I think I'm, I'm dead center in the middle. <laughs> um, if, if we talk too much about it, I, I think that, um, some issues I'm on on one side and and others on the other, and it, it always leads to a fun conversation if you choose to dive into it. <laughs> are they both uh, still uh, living? Yes, your mom and your yeah, dad. They and are. so now, oh my gosh! I mean, when you were growing up, you know, it was one thing. Now, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, for the most part, I just keep my mouth shut in the in the political <laughs> realm of things. So, do they still um, debate and bring things up and talk about issues and politics? Well, and, so they they separated when I was three. Okay, uh, so okay. it. It's always been a different household, oh, different gotcha. conversation okay. sort okay. of thing. Yeah, now that's fascinating that you're getting you're getting both sides. Um, you're getting Fox at one house and CNN at the yeah, other. So yeah, that's for sure. uh, interesting. Um, where did you go to college? Uh, I went to Embry Riddle Aeronautical University, and that's in Daytona Beach, Florida. Uh, it's a really cool place. Um, actually, didn't go there first. Went um, I went to Aviation Maintenance School in Tallahassee, Florida. Uh, at a little place called Lively Technical Center. Right out of high school, I really was not driven to do the college route. Was really interested in engines and things that, you know, go fast and that sort of thing. So did that in 18 months and then was able to kind of parlay those credits over to Embry-Riddle, which allowed me to do a, a Bachelor of Science in two and a half years. Excellent. Um, so it's kind of the same time time span uh, as college. Uh, actually ended up being a little cheaper as well for getting those 18 credit hours out of the way on, on the first year and a half. I, and I think that's it's, it's interesting to me that so many parents are just really shoving their kids into college, you know, f- beginning in their freshman year in high school, you know, just beating it over their head. And teachers are, you know, so aggressive. Um, right. I don't right. know if you have um, kids old enough to be well, going I, through that. I have a 12 year old and a 15 year old. Yeah, so, so they're starting right in to it. feel that pressure of, of college coming and, yeah. and all that sort of thing. Which is great, but there are uh, great alternatives. Absolutely. You know, that I think everybody should know that it's okay if their kids want to go a different route. 
Yeah, and, and my personality was always if somebody's going to tell me what to do, then I'm going to have to push against that. And and so it, probably them allowing me to, to just go do a technical school for a, a year made me kind of realize, okay, yeah, that is what I want to do. And now it's my idea instead of theirs. And that, yeah. that's a little more uh, appealing to me. And the aviation was a big part of your, um, you know, what you like to do. And you, did you want to be a pilot? I did. So when I went to Embry Riddle, that was the the next two and a half years was getting my pilot's licenses and commercial, and then finishing out the degree program. The Embry Riddle uh, was actually one of the only. I think there was another school that offered kind of a, a double major of maintenance and and pilot uh, program. And so that that was why I kind of went that direction. Was they they allowed me to to use those credits and kind of put it all into into one degree. And so do you still fly today? I, I do for fun, mainly. Uh, I don't get a whole lot of time uh, to fly. Once once we had kids, um, recreational things like that kind of went out the window. Um, and my wife doesn't like to just go blow holes in clouds. But if we're going somewhere, she's good with it. Yeah. But yeah. she wants to have a purpose for everything. And yeah, you could have not flown just, here today. You know, we yeah, have, that would have been awesome. Here. Yeah, it probably would have been. It was a little quicker, foggy. <laughs> yeah, quicker <laughs> yeah. to drive. Yeah, and how, so how did you end up? Because uh, you were in Florida with sunshine, and you know, how did you end up in Tennessee? I, I think ultimately, home always calls. Got married right out of college um, to my wife, and it it felt like the um, as Lisa re- referred to earlier, the the cost of living was appealing. And just wanted to come back home and get closer to family. We actually uh, moved back. When we moved back, we moved to Nashville. Mm. Um, she worked at Opryland Hotel, and I was working for a flight school, kind of building up flight time, doing mechanic work to to pay the bills, and then flying and and getting my uh, flight instructor's license to kind of gear up to um, be a flight instructor. And then what? And we're going to talk about. Uh uh, driving innovation here in just a minute. Yeah. But, um, what what did you do between you know driving innovation and those flight sure. school years? Um, I, I'm pretty sure I have ADD. I, I'm of that age that you know my parents never had me actually diagnosed, but I'm pretty sure I have ADD. Uh, so did the aircraft maintenance for a while. Um, so came, I, I graduated in 2001, and and so when we moved to Nashville, it was roughly the spring of 2001, um, doing the, the maintenance work at uh, the flight school. Uh, when September 11th happened, it kind of caused a huge shift in the aviation world. All of my buddies that were a year or two ahead of me that were flying for regional airlines, all of a sudden they were furloughed and Everyone was starting to trickle backwards. The the pilots in the majors were trickling into the regionals. The regionals were letting those guys off, and and so they were trickling back down into flight instructors. So there, there was a, a couple of years there after September 11th that the aviation industry just sort of shrunk, and understandably the public, uh, you know, sort of lost confidence and that sort of thing. Um, so, kind of took a, a little bit of a break from. From being a pilot, I, I was also coming to the realization that if I wanted to be a pilot, that meant I was going to be out of town about two weeks out of a month, um, and new wife and that sort of thing. Um, that lifestyle that seemed appealing when I was in school, kind of that that dream sort of melted away as I realized that having a family was going to be tough. Um, there, there's a saying in aviation, they call it AIDS, aviation induced divorce syndrome. Oh, yeah. um, and you know, that, that was kind of a priority shift for me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so all that to say, uh, we moved back after September 11th to, uh, Jackson. My stepfather at the time was running an airport and I started a, a maintenance business there at the airport. Um, and my wife started working at a restaurant in Jackson and a um, few years later, the uh, the restaurant changed hands, and they uh, the the new buyers were ready to do something different, and um, they approached us to purchase the restaurant. So she and I bought a restaurant in uh, two thousand and seven, 
And um, uh, what kind of what kind of food? Uh, it was. It, it's called Dumplings Restaurant. Um, it's still there today. It's a great place. Um, it's. I think best term was ladies' tea room. Uh, which it, it's funny now saying that that I ran a ladies' tea room. Uh, but um, my my wife's a pastry chef, so oh. she she really. Um, that that was her her niche and her baby and and I just helped kind of manage that and and keep the doors open and manage the employees while she got to do the creative artistic. That's, that's a big part shift of to go from the it airport was. and and to be doing that and that's that's hard work. It, the it was business is rough. It was and, it, and it, actually when we bought it, uh, my wife was pregnant with our second child. Oh my gosh! Uh, so we uh, Riley was born while we were in the restaurant business yeah. and. and um, so we we did that for another four years, and decided to sell it in uh, 2012. Okay. Um, so jumped out of the restaurant business, uh, jumped into a, a an internet startup that um, dealt in. It's called Popvox, and it basically is trying to help people uh, communicate with their representatives um, on specific legislation and that sort of thing, um, and so. Yeah, jumped into that. I, I actually downloaded it last night. And, okay, and awesome. Signed up, so I'm a Pop Vox member now. Very cool. It's, Thank it's, you. It's very uh, easy to use, and uh, it was really fun to look it over. And what I found fascinating was, you know, it shows who your what, what bills your representatives have either, uh, you know, backed, co-sponsored, or supported, or, co-sponsored, all that. Sure. So that was really fascinating to read that. So, and it, it's very specific, and all of that. Um, if you weigh in on a bill there on Popvox, that communication goes directly to your representative. Um, and you are a verified constituent coming through us. Um, most people don't realize a, uh, a representative doesn't want to hear. Nancy Pelosi doesn't care what you think. Um, she represents she her district. Uh, well, <laughs> <She did>. for, <laughs> I, I know a lot of people Nancy. want to tell Nancy what they think. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, she is only responsible for her constituents. And um, frankly, if you send her communication from your district, it's... Um, her professional liability to make sure that her your representative receives that correspondence. So um, that's kind of what PopVox is aiming to do is is provide constituent communication from verified constituents. And it came out of uh, you and your sister working together and your sister. Yeah, she she, she for the most part uh, she and a couple of other co-founders started it. Uh, I was still in the restaurant business as it was being co- uh, being started. And, uh, of course, I was a champion on the sidelines, but I, I couldn't sell the business fast enough to, to get over there and, and be there at the beginning. Yeah. Um, so more help on the, on the back end of, of starting it. And how, how is it going now? Is it's going it still, well. It's, it's active and a lot it of— It is. Uh, okay. um, I've, I've kind of taken a sabbatical to, to do the driving innovation program because I knew it was just going to take everything that I had— um, and then some, I think. So tell me about tell me about driving innovation and sure. how that started, and then how you got involved in that whole story. Okay, so it, it's um, it's kind of spun off of the co um, as the the co was charged with serving. 11 counties and the co uh, outside is of the uh, five guys who got together. That's right. And didn't and not, not the burger hamburger. joint. Yeah, they didn't do uh, hamburgers. That's they right. started the co instead. That's right. Um, and so it's a, like a worker space where everybody comes together and people can take advantage of each other's skills and the tools and, yep. and things like that. Hel- so, helping small businesses, entrepreneurs um, and creatives, get their their ideas out, um, help them maybe not make the same mistakes that others before them have, or, or um, you know, how can we help sort of smooth the path out for them and, and help them get started is sort of the ethos of the co. And um, so, so driving innovation came out of sort of a group yeah, so um, we were charged with serving 11 counties that surrounded Madison County. As as we were getting started, um, we saw lots of people from Madison County. We were not having a whole lot of luck pulling people from outside of Madison County to come to the co. Uh, one of the co-founders actually, and who has this, but uh, Ben Ferguson had a bus that he wasn't doing anything with. Uh, I think it was a like a 1989 Bluebird bus. Um, it was 
really great unit. Um, I say that in jest. <laughs> um, but we decided that we would kind of do as best we could put the co inside of something with wheels. Uh, so we created what we called the co-mobile um, to go to these surrounding counties and, and help those small businesses as well. Since they wouldn't come to us, we would go to them. Uh, so we, we sort of bootstrapped creating that thing over, uh, I think, about a four- or five-month period. We built this bus out um, and started serving the other counties. And who was the – do you remember the first – County that you, oh, that's and a I'm, great I'm fascinated question. by this because so you guys are in Jackson, which is you know you know fairly large, right. um, and then you know we're here an hour and a half away in Union City, um, so we're definitely a rural community. Sure, and so you know I think the culture of a rural community, you know, is you have different groups of people, and this is my observation, and you can tell me how this you know gels with whatever Sounds you about guys right. are doing. So so far, um, you know, you have you have. People who are wanting to do new and interesting and exciting things and yet don't even know where to get started. Mm -hmm. You have people who absolutely do not want things to change. They want to do everything they can to keep things as they are. Sure. And then you have people who are just trying to get food on the table and who are just in such a, you know, having such a struggle just day to day that thinking about anything new and innovative is just out of reach at this time. Sure. So that seems to be sort of the the little communities that are buzzing around with people I think that's pretty know, accurate. on a spectrum. So you guys decided, you know, look, we're going to you're in a lot of ways you're introducing some of these communities to a new idea. And so do, how did you go about setting up your bus and getting people to come in it? And was it successful at first? The, uh, this was about the time that Haslam was getting the Tennessee Reconnect uh, program going, which is uh, that there's funding out there for people that had previously attended college and maybe didn't complete it uh, to get funding to go in and, and complete that degree program. Um, and so they were giving grants out and things to get the word out, get people signed up and, and that sort of thing. And um, so we teamed up with the Southwest Development District to help them sort of get, get around to those counties and get people signed up for the ReConnect program. And so who – do you recall some of the early – Places you so went. It, we usually did it in sort of a roadshow format where we would go out and hit two or three counties in a day. They would just put us on a bus and we so, would I mean, sit they, there and we would be we would be in uh, <laughs> you know Camden today yeah. and, and next stop Bolivar and, and the people would just come in and meet with you to hear more about you know what you guys were doing and did you make good connection? What, was it a was that a good way to go about it? It, it was. It, it was. Um, I think it was effective in in that people didn't have to travel too far. We could we could do a little bit of social media um, ads in newspapers and get them to a central location that was close for them inside of their town, um, and us come to them. And it was a good way, I think, for you guys to sort of dip your toe in the water of what eventually you would be doing. Um, today with some of the initiatives that you have going on. It, it was it, the the unit itself was fantastic for um, being the we, we call it the MVP, uh, the the best possible um, test of a concept. And that's minimum viable product, um, which may not translate well to a bus, but it, it's kind of some of the terminology that we use. But it was it was a good um bootstrappy or cheap way of testing a concept of how does how well does a bus um, help getting the technology or the um, concepts around people and and that sort of thing when I love the idea of meeting people where they are you know, sure. of taking these great opportunities because somebody may not be able to get to Jackson. Mm -hmm. you know, for for one reason or another, and they're more comfortable. If if I'm in their town, they're more comfortable with with just themselves in that they're somewhat in a familiar place. I'm the outsider, and and they're in in their familiar place. And you know, when you're dealing with entrepreneurs that are having to talk about their finances or where they're having problems, it's super important that they feel comfortable um, to to 
talk about some of the things that, you know, they wouldn't even tell their brother-in-law if he was asking how their business was going. Right, <laughs> and, right. and we need them to be up front with how things are going so that we can be helpful to them. And so uh, that parlayed into, why don't you talk a little bit about what you sure. guys are doing today? Sure. Um, so the the Comobile, uh, we, we actually took it to the governor's conference and um, the – Randy Boyd, who was head of the ECD at the time, mm-hmm. um, saw the concept and and really thought that it was um, a great way to get out to the rural areas. Uh, and so there was a um, governor's rural task force that was formed of many, many members. And this was one of the concepts that came out of the rural task force uh, was to build out three buses that would go across the state, mainly driven to serve the distressed and at-risk counties uh, inside of Tennessee, which those are mainly the rural counties. The concept was to build uh, three different buses. One would be a STEM bus, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math uh, uh, always forget to leave, put the A back in, but it's steam bus. Yeah, we around here we really lead with steam. Like we, right. we have steam Saturdays, and you know we're, it's a big part of our uh, mission here. Also serving uh, the same uh, counties you guys are serving. Sure, and so that's you know the overlap there is pretty significant. Yeah, it's great. Um, so we we built out the steam bus. Uh, the second bus was um, a entrepreneurship small business unit. Uh, and the third unit is a um, placemaking bus. And that all three of these buses have been built in phases. So the first year we built the steam lab, uh, actually built that in 58 days. Uh, we were kind of under the gun of a deadline. Uh, nothing makes you move quicker than a deadline. Yep. Um, but we built that one in 58 days, put it on the road. And it's, what's in it? Describe, you know, for yeah, sure. Who, what is it like when you walk into so, it? So uh, we have everything from 3D printers. We have a uh, what we call a collaborative robot, or actually he's called a collaborative robot, which is a robot that can be programmed um, just with motion. And he's he's got a, a an arm or wings span of about six and a half feet. So he's kind of intimidating. How do you know it's um, a he? Well, his name is Baxter. Oh, okay. So the, the so company name. named him Baxter. Gotcha. So I assume okay. that it's a he, but okay. uh, thank you for, for that. <laughs> um, but it, for some reason, I usually end up naming machines women's names. But, <laughs> but um, So you got Baxter on there, um, 3D printers, laser cutters, etchers, um, CNC routers, Lots of virtual reality and um, quite a few drones and and different um, robotics and things like that. So lots of technology crammed in one little space. And who's like te- – who, who, how many people are on the bus that are teaching? I'm assuming you pull up to a school um, – and then the students come in. Who is on the bus talking about that? Sure, um, we've got a staff of about four that go out with the bus because um, it's it, you can really only get about fifteen kids on there at a time. Um, in the first phase of programming, what we've been doing is is basically a field trip on wheels, where we show up to a school and all all the kids inside of the school have time to come through it, so we can run about. 15 um, children in about 15 minutes. So we cycle them through relatively quickly, uh, but give them about an a inch deep, mile wide feeling of um, the technologies and things like that. We're in process of, of changing to a phase two programming with that unit where we will um, spend, and it's going to depend on the school, and, and we're still sort of working on the programming, but where we can spend – uh, an hour or a class period with 15 to 30 kids um, and be able to give them a much more immersive experience. An hour is still a tough thing to do when you've got all this technology and you really want to expose them to all of it. An hour is tough, but we've broken it up into right now we have three different programs that we will do um, robotics, bridge building, where we get to break stuff, and um, a virtual reality build out sort of challenge. And does it all take place in the bus, or are you move? We're going to have to do two class? of those inside of the classroom, yeah. just for space reasons, and we'll do the virtual reality on on the unit itself. Yeah, um, and then we'll still have uh, the ability for everybody to kind of come through the bus and see all of the the things. 
Um, but so, so that program will be much more immersive for 30 kids per class period. So we'll, we'll see, you know, roughly a hundred, something like that in a day. Um, and, and that way they have, um, a lot more time to demystify some of this technology because it, it somewhat feels unapproachable uh, until they really start using it and they realize that this is not as hard as as it appears um, or you don't have to be as nerdy as maybe you thought you did to run a 3D printer or a laser etcher or that sort of thing. How, how um, open are you finding the school's you know, are you guys packed nonstop and you can't take any more, or we, has there been some hesitancy? No, we we usually uh, we we get lots of requests, um, and usually it's not not hard to get into uh, a school to to do the programming. Because I would think, I mean, this is like if I was a administrator or a principal, I'd want you guys there every day. Well, and. I, I, it is tough, though, because, you know, it's a disruption to their normal school day. And, oh, and you know, they've got to get no each teacher reason. to figure it out. Well, they I, should, their I, day I should share be that. disrupted. <laughs> I agree. Disruption <laughs> is what they need more of. That's true. That is true. Um, so that was one. What are the other What are the other? Yeah. Uh, uh, so the, uh, the other unit is the entrepreneur bus. We call that the venture. We go to the distressed counties or, or the rural counties and meet with small business. We were actually in Hickman County on Monday, met with about 12 different entrepreneurs and businesses that are um, there and on the square. And now just, just for it, for the, the sake of anybody who's even questioning what, how would you describe an entrepreneur? What, who is an entrepreneur? I, you know, I, an entrepreneur is someone that is willing to take a step outside of their comfort zone and and meet a need that they see or or a fix a problem that they see, and and they're really kind of taking it on themselves to do that, um, and that it can be a really lonely place because, um, like I said earlier, you know you it's sometimes really hard to figure out who to go to with your problem or your questions. And, and sometimes you may not feel like you're even comfortable sharing those issues or problems, but, but they're real. And, and there were days when we were in the restaurant business that I felt like just going to bed and putting the covers over my head. Cause you know, just didn't know how I was going to deal with whatever X or Y that came up that seemed like it was just the biggest problem I've ever had. And see, I think that some of the challenges people, a lot of people associate the word entrepreneur with tech, you know, and sure. so they're not even, a, so there may be people out there running businesses who don't even, you know, if they saw the word entrepreneur, they don't associate with that word. And so I think right. I was thinking about you in the restaurant business and thinking, man, you were like, you know, definitely, you know, learning how to help entrepreneurs on the road, I mean that's like that's hard stuff. Restaurant business. Well, and and I think you, um, I, th I think it was a good question too about who is an entrepreneur because I, this area is full of entrepreneurs. Farmers are entrepreneurs. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, they've taken a risk to buy a seed and put it in the ground and wait two months, three months, think that the weather, you know, hope that the weather is going to be good and be able to pull a harvest and make a profit. I mean, that's. Honestly, some of the first entrepreneurship that this area ever had. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, just so, settling this area was entrepreneurship. Absolutely, you know, absolutely. People who came here from you know North Carolina and settled and took the risk, and you know some failed and you know others succeeded. So you know, sure, it's, it's, that's all. That's what entrepreneurship is all about. It is um, thinking you can make something better and giving it your best shot. Mm -hmm. And so were you involved? I, I looked online and I saw something about the Selmer Farmers Market event where you were brain, everybody was brainstorming. Big table, big ideas. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Were you involved in that? Yes. Um, and, yeah. Okay, well, tell, so so that was the rollout event for the AMP, which is the third unit and the um, placemaking unit. Uh, and l like I said, we've we've kind of rolled these units out, built them out and rolled them out um, in a phased sort of thing. And the AMP is the last one that we've completed. And honestly, we're still in process of working through programming and, and that sort of thing. Our first 
sort of experiment, and a lot of these have been done as experiments of um, let's try something, let's see what happens, see if it's effective, does it make impact, take what we what did work and use it, what didn't, put it away, and, and we'll try it again or, or whatever. So um, what was the – I know a smidge about design thinking. You know, I've worked with companies like IDEO a little bit, and okay. so I saw a little bit of that in what I was reading about this exercise that you guys did. So tell me a little bit about what was the challenge and what were you – you know, what were you initially trying to accomplish and what uh, process did you go through? I, I will say that William Donnell, who is one of the other co-founders, he is much more of our uh, – he, he's our design thinking sort of guru. Um, so a lot of that sort of thing I follow his lead of. But a, a lot of the idea is that with placemaking, you need the entire community to be singing from the same songbook. And so you need everyone somewhat to feel like they have a say in – what you're going to go try to do, and and get everyone's buy-in on it. If you were speaking of the factions that kind of exist in a rural community, those are somewhat detrimental to to making things better or taking it to uh, improving a community. Um, is when those factions are so protective of their turf that. They don't want things changed, and, and they is, want them to is, stay the it same. It is easier to tear things down than build things up. Absolutely. So the, the first way of, of trying to kind of bridge those gaps is is to have everybody sit down and have a meal and talk um, and talk about their ideas of, of what they would like to see for the community. And, and that was kind of the general thought process of, of Big Table Big Ideas was – getting those people together and talking, brainstorming. And they were wanting to uh, have more business in McNary County, or what was the their objective? It, all of the above. Okay. Um, I, I think all of these communities are looking for ways to increase tourism. Um, how do you get the retail on Court Square to be where people want to come walk around on a Saturday and spend their day and spend their money? Um just general liv- livability of of the community is what I think most of these communities are trying to improve on. Now you had um, uh, it looked like hundreds. I don't know if it was a hundred or it was I think a it lot was of people. Hundred, hundred and fifty, yeah. something and like there that. Was catfish. It was a big table. There was catfish. There, there was, was catfish. Food, you know. Absolutely. So that was you probably had some people there just because they wanted to eat. Um, sure, so, and that's okay. Yeah, so, that's okay. So is there a is there a is there a too many? Is it what you know? I don't. First of all, I mean, just trying to lead a brainstorming session with like ten people can right. be a challenge. So, well, post-it notes are your friend, um, and we we sort of asked them when they were having discussions to break it up into eight to ten people um, as they're having discussions. But a lot of it is the exercises that William uses um, are sort of asking questions, having you do a massive brain dump of, okay, I'm going to give you two minutes and give me 10 ideas um, so that you don't have your um, the part of your brain that says no. Like you're trying to switch that off for a minute and, and dump all of the ideas out. Uh, and he's kind of tricky in that then you'll take your ideas and you'll split them up into – Really hard but cheap, um, really easy but cheap, and uh, sort of a Venn diagram. Sure. Uh, and then you end up throwing about three quarters of those post its away. Uh, you don't realize that until he says, Okay, now pick these up and throw them in behind you. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Um, those sort of exercises that, that have you um, make those decisions without knowing you're making those decisions is the beauty of, of those exercises, I think. So as a follow up to all of that, so it, I mean, it looks, the pictures are amazing that, you know, it was a cool event. What came out of it? So we took the data that, or the feedback that we got, we actually had everyone put their post-it notes up on the side of a bus um, and then created an, an aggregated list of here's what 
at least the folks here, which we think was a pretty good sampling of people of McNary County, here's how they feel about these specific topics. And this is what they're looking to have in McNary County. Some of them were were not doable. You know, I can't bring a shopping mall to McNary County. Or a Cracker um, Barrel. Or Cracker Barrel. Everybody or wants a Cracker Barrel. We got a great spot for a Cracker Barrel. Everybody around here wants a Cracker Barrel. Gotcha. Um, and, there was a nice uh, piece of land right as we were driving exactly, in. Three brand new hotels. Yeah. There's a spot. Yeah. So everybody could. Now, I personally am trying to get Thai food in here. Would you guys come and do a whole session on what, how food? we can get a Thai restaurant here? Because I miss, or Vietnamese. I miss that. Gotcha. Well, we've got Thai food in Jackson, right across I, from the I Co. Know. You're welcome. I go to. there all the time. I, I've never been to the Co, <laughs> but it, it it is. I do have to drive an hour and a half to go get. Or Paducah has some good. Okay. Some good Thai and Vietnamese. Gotcha. So it's it's not too bad. Just need to find somebody else that shares your love for Thai food, or maybe you need to go into the Thai food. Yeah. Restaurant business. Yeah, I'm too old for that. <laughs> I don't have that energy anymore. So, um, good things came out of it. Have they actually executed any of the ideas? Do you know? We we have given them given the aggregated data to the mayor's office. Yeah, it wasn't and, that long ago that, that sort of thing. Did this, so. uh, it was the beginning of summer. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we're we're still trying to figure out what what do we do with that information and how can we be helpful to um, that specific community. It, it's tough because we've got roughly sixty counties that we're trying to serve. Um, and where we would love to set up shop and, and, you know, for a month, stay in McNary County and get tools out and, and help them get going. We just can't. Um, and so we're, we're kind of trying to figure out how can we make, uh, how can we help those communities get started and, and get going on doing some of these projects. And so if somebody's listening and they are in a, in a town, in a rural community in Tennessee, and they, they are thinking, ha, ah, this is for us, you know, what, where, where should they go to look for contact information? Sure, uh, tndrivinginnovation.com. Okay, and so they can go there. What is, what is next for the organization? We are honestly still finishing building out the programming. Um, building the units themselves was was a pretty big undertaking. And now that they're complete, we're kind of still in process of figuring out um, programming for all three of the units. I spoke a little bit about the STEAM lab. Um, you know, the f- very first thing to do was for us to just get it on the road and, and get these this technology in, in their hands. Now it's, okay, what's going to make the biggest impact? How do we empower these kids to, to go look for these high-tech careers and go to, to um, schools to, to do these jobs? And so we've kind of put them all out there, and now we're sort of perfecting the programming that we're running on them. We need to look for ways we can work together to get, uh, Absolutely. To get, get some of that going here because sure. um, our missions overlap. You know, like so, so well. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for, for joining me. This has been um, fascinating. My head is buzzing with all the possibility. Cool. Thanks for having us. And now let's go find out a little bit more behind the scenes at Discovery Park of America. Hello, everyone. I am Andrew Gibson with the Education Department here at beautiful Discovery Park of America. And today I'm with Zach Ray, an education specialist here. Today he's going to be sharing with us a little bit more about what exactly? Uh, we're going to be talking about the 1914 Christmas truce that happened in uh, World War One. Christmas truce or truth? Truce. Okay, we'll take it away. The 1914 Christmas truce was, just as the name says, It was the early part of the war. We were only about five months into the war. Um, It was a truce between the British and French forces with the Germans. Um, At this time, what they had was the race to the sea. It was building up fortifications all along the coast. You know, trench warfare was very prevalent during this time period. And it was a race between which side could get either the most fortifications up or get one up on their other side so it was kind of a stalemate in that sense and during this time the soldiers were waiting for their next orders on what to do and it came about on december 20 uh, 25th um, 1914 that the soldiers 
on the British side were sitting there and at night um, waiting to see what was going to happen when all of a sudden they started hearing music coming from the other side. And one soldier was sitting there listening and he realized he was hearing Silent Night being sung in German. And then what ended up happening is they decided to join in the singing. They started singing Silent Night. They started singing all kinds of Christmas carols. Well, the next morning, which was Christmas, they all woke up. The story goes that one of the British troops decided to come up above the trench and slowly raise his hand. Everybody was freaking out because if you stand up above the trenches during the trench warfare, you were probably going to get shot. And to their surprise, the soldier didn't get shot. On the opposite side, the German side, a German troop came, a soldier came up and was, they slowly started walking towards each other. Then the rest of the platoon started coming up. Now, this only happened in certain locations, but the most famous one, which there are pictures of this, they met, they shook hands, they actually exchanged Christmas presents. And one of the very famous uh, pictures you'll see is they actually started playing sports together. They played football or um, soccer. Uh, and they started having fun. They started exchanging gifts, uh, singing Christmas carols, and just having a good time with each other, getting to know each other. Uh, one of the stories goes, it was kind of shocking that one of the German soldiers had exceptionally long hair because of just being in the war, didn't have time to get a haircut. And one of the British soldiers was good at giving haircuts, so they actually sat there in the middle of the battlefield in no man's land, and one of the German soldiers got himself a haircut well, they're now we're talking about soldiers who the day before were shooting at each other, you know, trying to kill each other. Now they're giving each other a haircut. What do you mean by no man's land? No man's land was the area where if you've ever seen any pictures of World War One, it is that area that is like a barren wasteland. It's where explosions happen. The, the ground was just devastated by artillery fire. Uh, it had barbed wire, had all kinds of fortifications on it. Basically, it was called No Man's Land is because if you stepped out into No Man's Land, you were probably going to die. Um, the only time you did was when you tried to leave uh, your trench and t- try to take over the other tr- the enemy's trench. And the fact that this happened is one, I guess you can call it one of the few miracles that happened during World War One. This was the only time that this actually happened. It happened, a, it happened, they tried to get it to happen a couple more times, but it never happened succeeded like this one on the on 1914 or in 1914 uh, I should say and the sad thing of it is is December 26 the fighting re- commenced and a lot of people were wondering you know you might be thinking now it's like how did these people go back to fighting each other after literally spending Christmas day with each other and getting to know each other um, the story goes that one of the lieutenants on the uh, British side actually his squadron mates um, asked him and said how are we going to get back to fighting and the story goes that he, he there was a german soldier running towards the trench on the other coming across to the other side i guess the com- fighting has commenced and he shoots the guy dead so goes after that the com- fighting commenced and you're talking about this happened five months into the fighting we're talking about 51 months worth of fighting by the end of the war no other time other than this there was a truce just like this. Well, all right, Zach, thank you so much for coming on today and sharing more. Uh, I know I learned quite a bit today, and I hope all of our listeners did as well. Um, you can learn more about uh, military history in our extensive military gallery, and a large collection of different artifacts, different short stories to be told there. Uh, once again, thank you all for listening. We hope to see you here at Discovery Park of America. We'll see you. Thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward. If you enjoyed this podcast, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a review on iTunes or wherever you may be listening. Plan your own adventure to see beyond at Discovery Park of America by visiting discoveryparkofamerica.com. Be sure to also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates.